I shall get started. So uh, welcome to the um, debugging and profiling workshop. Uh, this is the fifth workshop in uh, this semester's Hacker Tool series. So um, I'm Huawei from NUS Hackers. Um, let me check that everything is working. All right. Um, so yeah, the slides are available here. Um, you can follow along, although uh, I have to say the slides are not the, uh, how do you say, the slides this time are not, say, super uh, detailed. Uh, most of the, yeah, m most of the explanation will be you know, done by me, uh, instead of being from the slides. So, um, as usual, we are following, um, we are following the uh, MIT uh, lecture series, um, which used to be called Hacker Tools, but now they call it the Missing Semester of Your CS Education. Um, we are following the debugging and profiling um, lecture, uh, sort of, right? Uh, I loosely based around that. Uh, but you can go and um, go and look out and look at their. Um, you can go and look at their lecture as well if you want. Um, and their website provides a bit more information and some other information that I don't talk about here. Um, they also talk about some Mac OS things which I do not talk about. Okay, so back to our workshop. Um, yeah, so uh, hopefully you managed to install all the software that um, I mentioned in the uh, in the email as well as uh, I updated in the blog post like uh, yesterday. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry about the late uh, email today. Yeah, I, it's been a bit of a busy week. All right. Um, so let's just get started then. So this is the overview of what we will be covering today. There are some things that I did not uh, mention um, earlier or I didn't mention in the prerequisites because I, I added them in as I was preparing the, this, uh, preparing for the workshop. And th those are hyperfine and uh, I think it's only hyperfine. Uh, there may be more later on. I can't remember. Okay, so yeah, uh, we will be going basically in this order from uh, yeah so we cover debugging first followed by profiling then um, sis some system monitoring stuff and then some miscellaneous um uh, yeah whatever lah. uh miscellaneous tools that you can use to diagnose you, you may use to sort of diagnose or monitor things on your system or things like that Yes, the recording will be uploaded as usual. Um, what do you mean by which uh, Linux tools package? Uh, I think oh, if Ubuntu gives you a, if Ubuntu gives you a choice, you can install the generic one. If you have issues installing the packages on Ubuntu, I. I'm honestly not sure because I checked manually each of the pack um, that each of the packages exist. Um, yeah, so um, it could be some issue with your system or something like that. I don't know. Or maybe I got the package names wrong, but I actually checked manually, like uh, like like here that this the packages actually exist in like Focal. So like if you check Velgrind. It exists. So I'm surprised that you couldn't install it. Yeah, anyway. Uh, so let's get started. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, can you try like doing APT update first? And uh, seeing whether... APT update, update. Yeah, and see whether that helps. Okay, so today's focus, um, I'll be focusing more on the tools rather than like uh, 
uh, debugging strategies or things like that because um, oh, well uh, I will as in you will get some experience on the strategies as we uh, when we talk about deb- when we talk about debugging but uh, ultimately debugging is a sort of a skill that you have to sort of gain the intuition uh, by sort of um, you need to gain the intuition by actually like debugging and then like uh, you know um, yeah, seeing how how what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, so uh, I will not focus too much on like uh, like how to debug, but I will, but the focus will be on uh the tools uh yeah the tools to use and things like that. All right, so let's get started. Debugging. Um, so we'll first uh start off with the Python debugger, right? So uh the slides have. There are some information in the slides, uh, but um, I'll mostly just be demoing. Yeah, so basically to run the Python debugger, you run Python as per normal, but you have this dash m uh, pdb, um, right? And then you specify the script. Uh, that is one way to invoke the debugger. Like, there are a few other ways to sort of launch the Python debugger. Um, you can check that in the Python uh, the manual, which actually is linked here, right? Um, and these are the uh, well, these are some of the common uh, commands of the debugger. La. So, uh, yeah, instead of me reading through this, let's just uh try to debug a script, right? Um, so this uh, script is from actually from here, um, uh, right? Where is it? Uh, yeah, so this script is actually from here. Um, so uh, it is a buggy bubble sort, right? Um, if you know what bubble sort is, uh, you should be able to tell the bug right away. Uh, but for sake of uh, example, right? Let us uh, just, uh, let's debug the script. So um, hopefully my terminal is large enough. Hopefully my terminal font is large enough. Uh, large enough. Please let me know if it's not. Right. So. Um, give me a second. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, let us uh, debunk that script, right? That I showed here. So we can just open up in a file. I will name it buggy sort because it is a buggy bubble sort, right? And I'm just gonna paste it into my file, right? Uh, you can paste it into your file in any way you 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 yeah you prefer, and um, right? And then now we can just run uh, our buggy bubble sort, right? And you will see that oh we get an error, right? So uh, what are we gonna do? So if you don't know how to use a debugger. Uh, the simplest way is to just go in here and add some print apps and see what exactly is going on. Like, uh, why is there index out of bounds error and things like that, right? But we want to learn how to use a debugger, so we're going to, well, uh, invoke the debugger, right? So, when you first invoke, when you first launch uh PDB with your script, right? Uh, it's going to stop uh just before the first line in your script, right? Uh. So then you can decide what to do. La. So if we go back to our list of commands here, um, this will be when you set up breakpoints, right? things like that. So uh, now, uh, then you might ask, what exactly is a breakpoint, right? Um, well, when you break, it means you are, you're going to pause execution, right? And um, like, so that you, you are going to pause execution so that you can do things at this uh, debugging problem. Um, so that's what a break is. So when you have a breakpoint, that means that the function, or rather the the the, the runtime is going to break, uh, at that point, uh, right, uh, which is usually a line of code, right. And it will break. It will stop before executing, uh, that line of code, and then let you inspect or modify state or things like that, lah. It's mainly is for you to ex- inspect the state and see exactly what's going on. So, usually a breakpoint you can um. When you have a when you set a breakpoint, you can also uh, well the most basic is just to set a breakpoint at a line la. That's what you most commonly do, 
uh, but you can set a breakpoint with a condition. So that means that the breakpoint is only hit, uh, the, or the breakpoint only triggers when that condition is met. And that condition can be anything uh, referring to any like local or variable in scope la, um, at that point, uh, uh, at that line. So like you can set check that, oh, this variable is uh, uh, some value or more than some values. Any uh, valid Python expression. Right. So quite useful. But okay, let me, uh, let me stop talking and then we can just uh, start. Let me show you how to actually debug this thing. I haven't actually done anything, Alvin. Don't worry. Okay, so uh, we are again. We just started Python with the debugger, right? And we are going to start. Uh, so we have pause on the first line. So what should we do now? Um. So we know that this script runs into an error, right? So uh, the simplest thing to do is just let it run, right? And how do you let something run? Basically, you just press C, continue, right? So let's just continue. And when you're running in a debugger, um. If you run into an uncaught exception, it will basically stop at that point and let you. But uh, it will enter post mortem debugging. Basically, it's after the exception has occurred, right? So now you can sort of inspect uh, the what's going on, lah. So mm, one of the commands is this thing called where, right? Uh, it prints a stack trace. So um, a stack trace is basically, um, I think you should know what it is, lah, right? Uh, stack trace is basically a list of uh basically a function calls that have happened uh, to the point until uh, to get where you to get to where you are. La. So um you type W or where in a PDB to get a stack trace and it's from top to bottom meaning that the top is like the entry point and the bottom is where you are, right? So we started off at the PDB main and then PDB branch script something and then we finally get to our um uh, our script, right? And um yeah so it ran our code and then uh, yeah, here we are. And then it called bubble sort and then finally it got to our buggy or the line that has an exception which is this point, right? So uh, you see that there is an index out of range here. So what exactly is the problem? So we can use uh, print to solve, um, we can use this uh, print, right? To actually look at what's going on, right? So you can print the value of J. Right, so j is 5, okay. Um, what's the value of arr? Um, you can see that array is a list of uh, length um, 6, right? So then you can see the problem lies that um, j here is 5, so j plus 1 is 6, and 6 is obviously out of bounds for a list of length 6, right? And yes, another thing you can do is like, uh, well, this is just a Python built-in, which is the locals uh, function. Uh, this not, not this is not special to the debugger. It's just a it's just a Python function that gives you um, all the locals in a dictionary, so you can quickly see what's going on. Uh, so again, here we have our array, and then um, if you look at our script, we have our n, right? N is the length of the array. Um, I is um, the outer loop counter, and the J is the inner loop counter. A yeah, so. What is the bug here, anyone? Why is J5? Uh, right, so our J here should range until N minus 1, right? Not N. So let's uh, quit. And uh, let us fix the bug. Okay, let us run again. Uh, let's run it outside the debugger first. Oh, okay. It didn't accept now. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, obviously this is not uh, our well. It's sorted, right? It's sorted, but it's obviously not our list, right? So um, what exactly uh, went wrong, right? Um, so again, we can go to the debugger now. Okay, I mean, okay, I think it's quite obvious what is wrong, uh, but we are going to use the debugger to see what is wrong. So um, now you can. If you look here, there is this list, right? So we're gonna just check. Uh, we're just gonna print the source code around the current line, and we see that okay. I think it might be interesting to set a breakpoint at line six. So we're gonna just type p six, right? And so it's tell me that it has set a breakpoint at um, yeah, at, at 
the line 6 of this file, right? And so um, the, the, the good thing about breakpoint is that it only triggers if you actually are going to execute that line, right? So you notice that this line is actually uh, behind an if condition, right? So that means that if this if condition is not met, then we won't trigger the breakpoint, right? So um, no, it, we, we sort of get that for free. La. So we only trigger the breakpoint when we are actually going to execute this line, right? It doesn't matter if this line is... Uh, so if this if condition is not met, then we won't actually trigger the line, okay? So uh, once we have set our breakpoint, then we can press continue, uh, C, and it will continue to that line. So now we have stopped that uh, yeah, line 6 of buggy sort. And, uh, okay, so we're going to print the value of array. Uh, whoops, print the value of array, right? So, and yeah, so if we are index zero and we're supposed to swap, uh, so at this point, we're supposed to swap index uh, zero and I guess index one, right? Uh, that's what bubble sort does. So, what we can do, uh, we're just gonna step a single line, so we're just gonna type s so we step and then we can print array again oh sorry <laughs> and we can print array again and we'll see that something has gone wrong right we have set uh, the first element to 2 and the second element is still 2 right so mm, let's step again and see what happens so I print array again you can see that um, I print array again you can see that oh okay so actually, there's something wrong with the swap. La. And so, um, yeah, basically what we want to do is actually swap. But what we're doing here is we're overwriting the uh, lower element with the higher element. And then that's it, right? So to fix this, uh, what we want to do is, right, uh, that's what we want to do. And now, if we run our sort, we actually get a correct bubble sort. Right? So that is a demonstration of the uh, some of the commands of EDB. We are on slide 7. I mean, I'm demonstrating. Um, so let's look at some of the other commands again. Uh, so again, we can set a breakpoint at, uh, let's say, line 6. Um, yeah, let's set it at line 5. Uh, but I only want to trigger. I only want it to trigger when j is equals to uh, three, right? And so I can run. I can continue, and now I can see that j is actually three, right? So this is a breakpoint with a condition, right? And uh, I can press. Uh, I can type where. Again, print my um, what do you call it? I can print my stack trace, right? And the other thing you can do is actually to sort of navigate up and down the um, up and down the stack. Uh. So like I can press up, right? And I go up to this uh, sort of this uh, this stack frame, right? Um, and this is where so if I had like uh, if this was another function call, right? Um, then I could uh, inspect the locals at this particular function call. Um, but in this case, um, well, I, this is sort of the global, uh, the global scope lah. So there is nothing, uh, there's nothing else that I can inspect here that I cannot inspect um, from the lower um, stack frame. So how do I go back down into the original stack frame? Remember, I'm currently here, right? If I want to go back down here, I'm currently here. If I want to go back down here, I just press down, right, and it brings me back down to this stack frame. Uh, so you you will navigate stack frames um, and use it in conjunction with print la, right? So if you want to print certain values that are uh, like uh, certain function uh, arguments, right? Uh, um, from a upper stack frame, then you will navigate up to that stack frame, then you print, and then you can uh, yeah sort of see what's going on la. Okay, um, so that is uh, yeah that is PDB. Um, the other thing that I haven't mentioned was R, which is basically run until the function is going to return. And uh, let me delete my oh, and you can look at the help as well, right? And you can disable the breakpoint. Uh, yeah. So we have uh, if you just type B by itself, it will just list you the breakpoints, right? And uh, I'm just gonna delete, uh, disable my breakpoint one. 
then I'm going to press R to run until the function returns, right? So here it's going to return the um, sorted array, uh, which is actually, if you check, it's actually sorted in place. So actually, um, yeah. yeah. So we have run until the return, and then if we press next again, it will go out. Uh, it will go out. It will still, it will tell you that the function has returned, right? And this is the return value. Um, and then it will go out to, to the print statement. So this is before the print statement has executed, right? So press next again. I'm um, sorry. Yeah, that is actually after. Okay. So at this point, we were before the. Um, at this point, we were before the re the the print statement. Then you press next. This is after the print statement has executed, right? And you press next again. It has returned from um, the scope, and now we are out of the yeah, you know we are out of our script already. So now we're actually uh inside the Python internals. Yeah. So we can just uh, let it continue and we're done. Yeah. So program finished, right? So this is Python debugger. So um a debugger is useful, right? Because uh, instead of having to print F um you know uh having to go in and modify a program and print F stuff, um you know you can just run the script or run your program, right? Uh, under debugger, set breakpoints, and then go in and inspect uh, the state, uh, you know, and um, yeah. And you can sort of, uh, yeah, you, you can inspect the state and then see what exactly is going on here. Um, and like, you can sort of dynamically, you, you can decide, okay, once you have seen this, then you can decide what else you need to check, right? Uh, if you were to do printf debugging, then you would have to, um, you know, you print F once, then you see what what's the output from that, and after that you have to modify a program and compile it again, possibly, right? Or run it all the way again, um, in order to look at the new print Fs that you may insert. And then the other problem with print F debugging is when you forget to remove the print Fs uh, after you you're done debugging, and then you commit it, right? And then uh, later on someone comes and um, and then later on someone comes to disturb you and ask you hey where, where, where did why is this print doing here um is debugger at vsc any better yes uh they are so if you have an ide uh or or pseudo ide like vs code or visual studio or like uh, the JetBrains ides right um you can use you have a debugger that you can sort of uh set up you have a debugger with a graphical interface right so then what you can do is like uh you know you can sort of set like uh, like usually if you have an ID what you can do is you press the debug button right and then you can just set a breakpoint like that on the particular line that you want to see right um, so it's the same idea but um, I think it's uh, yeah so if you have PyCharm then you can just open up the script then you set your breakpoints by using the the gutter you know we call this the gutter right so you just click beside the line and then that will set a breakpoint there and then you can press the debug button and it will work exactly the same as a command line debugger. Um, yeah, that's the benefit of having a graphical or, or, or having an IDE. Law. Okay. Um, so that is PDB. Okay. Um, any questions? Um, if not, um, we will go and we'll go ahead and look at the GDB, right? Uh, GDB is it's a GNU debugger. Um, it for debugging mainly compiled programs, but actually you can debug anything with it, la. Uh, the only thing is that um, if you try and debug Python scripts with it, for example, it won't work very well because you'll be debugging the Python interpreter rather than your script itself. Uh, yeah. So if you're using compiled languages like uh, you know, uh, uh sorry, if you're using scripting languages or non uh, or languages that do not compile to uh, native uh, code like uh, javascript uh, .NET, java python all those you should use the debugger that is designed for your particular language right um, that will let you debug it uh, more uh, how to say that, that will let you debug it properly like instead of using gdb gdb is GDB, gdb can debug anything because it debugs native uh, programs right so everything eventually runs uh, some native code right uh, but 
if you are going to debug like let's say a Java program under GDB, it's gonna be a bit messy because you will end up uh GDB isn't de- designed to debug uh Java lah, for example, and so you will end up seeing all the Java virtual machine internals as well. Or you might not even see your actual code because uh it the uh, GDB doesn't understand uh Java, right? Um so the native compile languages, um like C and C++ and like say Rust and all those, uh, they emit what we call uh, debugging symbols. Uh, in Linux, it's called dwarf uh, format, dwarf format, D-W-A-R-F. On Windows, it's like the PDB files that you might see sometimes if you do Windows development, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so GDB will read those uh, debugging symbols to actually, uh, yeah, to, to to give you information about your program, uh, like uh, what what uh, line number or something that you're at, and things like that. Um, uh, but other languages, uh, I mean, non-compiled or uh, non-natively compiled languages, like uh, yeah, all those, right? Uh, do not emit Dwarf or whatever uh, native format it is. It is um. They rather they rather they emit their own uh, format instead. So you need to use the language specific debugger um yeah, in order to be able to debug that language. Well uh isn't Java compiled to native? Uh yes and no. Uh when you run Java C it's compiled to Java bytecode, uh which is a bytecode, right? Um then it is just in time compiled um just in time compiled by Thanks, Ken Hui. So yeah, it's just in time compiled by the VM on that system into native code. Yes, that's correct. But uh, the problem is if you run Java under the GDB, you're gonna you're gonna be debugging the the VM la, and the, the the native code, the JIT compiler. Yeah, instead of actually debugging your program. Uh, so you you can you can buy you can probably ins- you can probably debug your program by debugging the VM, but it's gonna be uh, very messy la. Okay, so how do you run GDB? Um, it's kind of similar. I mean, most debuggers usually you just uh, have the debugger and then you run the program after that. Um, yeah. And for native programs, sometimes you want to run arguments. Uh, you want to provide arguments to the uh, debugger. So for GDB, you have to run it like that. Um, yeah. So let's uh, look at some of the commands, right? So these are some of the commands. Again, I'm not going to. Uh, not going to. Uh, list them one by one, but uh, we will just uh, try and debug a program, and then we'll see. Uh, yeah, we will we'll experiment with the commands. Okay, so again, we have our program here, so we can compile it. Uh, we can copy it to a file, right? Uh, we'll call it access.c. So paste the program into your into your file using an editor of choice. We are at slide twelve. Twelve. Paste a program. Into your uh, paste the program into your editor of choice, right? And then we're gonna compile it. Um, we're gonna compile the program using um, GCC, right? That's why I asked you to have GCC installed. Uh, if you have Clang, that's also fine. Actually, you can just substitute GCC for Clang, right? So let me first explain what do all these flags mean. If you have never compiled a program on the command line before, uh, when you're compiling a C program or C plus plus program for that matter. Um, this flag dash g means to generate debugging symbols, right? Um, if you do not generate debugging symbols, then when you run your program under GDB, it will not be able to show you like uh, it because uh GCC will compile the program into machine code instructions or native instructions, right? Uh, GDB um needs these debugging symbols in order to tell you like uh which line of code that you are currently at. So if you do not uh compile with debugging symbols, then you are just going to see um machine code like, instead of your source code yeah uh which you can still debug with it it's just that it's not as uh convenient like, how to say yeah okay so let us compile our program uh and this flag just says what to name the executable so i'm just call it access uh, and then i'm going to compile access.c yeah so there should be no output right because um yeah there's no output like. it compiled successfully Right, so if I run access, uh, if I just run access, uh, you will see that it segmentation faults, right? It should segmentation fault on your system as well. Um, 
And so the thing about uh, well, if you look up for Python, uh, yeah, when we first ran this, uh, you know, for managed languages or scripting languages, usually when you have an exception or error, um, there's a stack trace, right? Uh, but of course, uh, for natively compiled uh, languages like like C, right? Um, usually there is no stack trace. Uh, this even this isn't even printed by the program itself. This is printed by the shell, right? So the program just died. Uh, so. How do we debug this problem? We're going to run it under GDB. So again, we're just going to do GDB and then dot slash access, right? So um, when you first run, when you run GDB, it's going to, yeah, you're going to dump you at the prompt, right? So the program has not started yet. So what you want to do is just um, press run and it will run the program. So starting program, right? And then after that, it will tell you program receive signal 6 v segmentation fault, right? And then it'll tell you where in the program you were. So again, like the PDB, um, we are going to look at uh, the stack trace. Um, in GDB, it calls it BT. Um, this is long, this is short for backtrace, right? Uh, BT. And you have a uh, tab completion in GDB as well. So you can type backtrace and then just press tab and then it will expand the command for you, right? So we press BT and then it tells us that, um, okay, and, and the BT, um, in GDB, the order is reversed uh, from Python. So in Python, uh, in GDB, the the current frame is at the top, and then the you know the parent frames are at the lower frames, right? So we were we are in access currently the access function, right? If you check our source code, uh, we are at the access function. We are at the access function and. Uh, so, and then the access function was called by main. How does GDB know the source code? Uh, okay, so basically, when you compile with um, debugging symbols, right? Uh, the debugging symbols contain uh, the path to the source code on your system. So, if your system, if GDB can find the source code at the same place where it was when you compiled it, then it will be able to look at the source code and tell you uh yeah which line it is so basically the debugging information contains things like okay so this instruction uh right it will contain things like saying this instruction corresponds to this uh, line of code and so on and so forth right um, so if you didn't have if you didn't compile with the debugging symbols uh all you'll be able to see is this uh, it wouldn't be able to tell you um the source code because it doesn't know which instructions correspond to which line of code right um, there are of course these things called uh, decompilers, like, which uh, they work great for things like Java and .NET, but doesn't work so well for um, uh, native compiled binaries because there's simply not enough information in the um, in a compiled binary uh, to you know uh, nicely decompile it into back into uh, C you know, because there's many possible programs that could have produced the same instruction, uh, same sequence of instructions. So anyway, we can do, we can ignore this uh, disassembler uh, code. Uh, it's not the point of this workshop. Um, if you know uh, x86 assembly, then uh, more power to you, I guess. <laughs> okay. So where was I? So we are going to use. Uh, we have looked at our stack trace. So yeah, and then you can press L to look at the uh, source code uh, around the current uh, yeah the current location that we are at. What else can we do? Um, so again, oops. Why am I at? Why am I at line eleven? Okay, yeah. So, um, again, like a PDB, what we can do here is now to inspect our environment, lah. So we want to see, um what is the actual issue here. So let's say, um, okay, why is there a sec fault, right? So let's print index. Mm, okay, so index, the value of index was one. Uh, that seems okay, right? Because uh, our array here is uh, uh, three elements long. Uh, what about array? Oh no, array is actually a null pointer. Okay, that makes sense, right? So actually the bug is here. Uh, so we can go up, um, we can go up one frame. So in uh, Python, you have the up and down commands, right? 
Uh, in GDB, what you can do is actually just jump to the frame directly. So I'm just gonna type frame one, right? And it will jump to the line of code that made the call. In this case, access zero one. So actually, I have uh, instead of passing the array, I've just passed in, passed in zero, and that is why we have a problem, right? So yes. So now I can go out and um, exit, right? And I can uh, edit my com, edit my program to provide the correct uh, pointer or provide the array instead of a null pointer, right? And then I can compile the program again. And now we can run again uh, under GDB. Or actually, we can just run the program and you can see that it prints uh, one as we expect, right? Uh, so now let us um, just run it under GDB again. So let me just demonstrate uh, the GDB breakpoints, right? So again, like uh, similar to Python debugger, what you can do is just type B. And then in this case, we can type 4. It's going to set a breakpoint at uh, access.c line 4, right? And so if we run the program, right, it will break at, uh, in this case, it wasn't an exception, like it's just a breakpoint, right? So, and it will tell us the, uh, it will tell us the arguments to the function. Um, yeah, it will tell us the arguments to the function that is at this frame, and then, yeah, we can also inspect things like array, inspect index, so you can see that here actually, uh, yeah, so we have provided the address to the array line, and the cool thing is you can, either, you can actually uh, sort of print uh, anything that is like a C-ish expression. It's not exactly C, but it is somewhat like C, so I can see like print 1 plus 1, like 2, you can print like star array, right? So you will expect this to print you 0, right? Because that's the first, uh, the type of array is in star, in pointer and which is this element. La. So if I want to, I can do even like array 0, print array 1. Um, I can even do things like, um, or you can do crazy things like, uh, let's, let's say do this. And just copy this address, and do this, right? It works as well. And if I want to do crazy things like print a null pointer, yeah. So GDB won't crash, I'll just tell you, oh, I can't actually access this memory, right? Uh, so there's a lot of things you can you, you basically you are basically currently inside the program's memory, so you can do whatever you want, right? Um, yeah. Okay, so that is uh that is GDB, right? Um so yes, you can step backwards. Um I mean you can print an arbitrary address, you can run like yeah. Uh do whatever you want really. So um uh, GDB as well has a help command. What happens when you try print array hundred? You'll probably print some garbage value. Um, uh how do I print memory? Give me a second, huh? Okay, so what you can do actually in GDB, right? Um, you know we have our array here, so I can just do like, uh, oops. What was the syntax of this? This is not in the slides. That's why I'm a bit. Uh, but since someone mentioned it, um, yeah. So. I can print, you can print any, you can look at the dump of memory basically. So like uh, here we are printing uh, 100 uh, bytes of memory, right? Um, So if I want to, yeah, if 
I want to print 100 bytes. So basically, the way this works is x slash 100 and then a unit, right? So the unit can be bytes, right? Bytes is one byte, right? Um, so then you can print 100 bytes or you can print like um, 100 words. Uh, a word is uh, well, uh, 4 bytes, right? And you can print a double word. A double word ends up to be the same. Uh, and then you can call it quad word. Oops. Uh, so that is uh, something you can do with GDB as well. Uh, basically, dump memory. Okay. Um, how does GDB execute expressions? As far as I know, it probably interprets them, right? And then, um, yeah, it probably interprets them and then just prints the result from that. Okay, so uh, where are we? So where are we now? We are currently at access, right? And what we can do is now, um, so we are here. So I can do things like, uh, just like the Python debugger, I can do step. So I can step to the next line that's executed. Uh, yeah, so if I step now, we are at line 5, which is basically returning from access. Um, we step again, we are at line 10. So that's the next line. And we are, okay, now we have returned from uh, our main function. Yep. And yeah, and then our process ha has exited. La. Right? So we can run our program again. And again, it brings us to the breakpoint, right? Um, the other thing you can do is, of course, uh, do SI. Um, so step. Um, step will step by line uh, or source code line, right? If you do SI, it will step by instruction. Um, so now you see we have stepped one instruction um, and we can step and continue stepping instruction. So if you actually, um, if you don't enter a command, right, it will just repeat the previous command. So you can just keep stepping instructions. Um, I mean, yeah, it, if you, uh, if you ever have to go down to assembly level, then uh, being able to step instructions is quite useful, right? Um, yeah, then you can step instructions, and then yeah, so now we're going to execute the yeah we're going to execute a printf. Oh, sorry, we're going to execute a printf, and now we are inside printf, right? So I'm just gonna. Uh, there is a step until the function returns, right? So I don't want to I don't want to step through a printf. I'm just gonna ask it to right uh, run to exit from um yeah run to printf uh, finishes and then we can go back out to main, right? Yeah. So that is the stepping um and um. So now let me show one cool thing, which is what you can do is basically uh, if you start the program and you press record, right? Okay, wait. Uh, where is my... Yeah. So there is a start command, which basically tells you to start and just start the program and then stop it at the entry point, right? Entry point is like your main function. Then at this point, you can type record. And basically now GDB is going to record your execution. Um, right, so what's the point of that, right? So let's again. Um, oops. Uh, Oh, I don't have my breakpoints, right? That's because I exited GDB. So let me again set a breakpoint at line 4. Um, yeah, I don't have any breakpoints now. Okay, and then I'm going to run until... Oops, I'm going to run until this breakpoint. Yes, this is similar to RR, but it's slightly less powerful. Um, so... I'm now at line 4, right? And uh, so what I can do is reverse step, right? So I have now actually gone back to main, right? And I can go back up again to R array. 
and then I can step and step and so on you know so uh, what's the point of reverse execution basically um yeah basically you know a lot of times when you have a breakpoint right uh or you set a breakpoint uh or an exception happens right exception actually happens um like before um or rather the exception usually happens after the actual bug uh you know actual after the location of the actual bug right so um a lot of times you want to be able to step backwards and see uh, and find the actual bug that happened beforehand, like somewhere earlier, which caused the exception to happen, right? So that's the point of reverse execution. La. So GDB lets you uh, reverse execute uh, to some limited extent. Yeah, or you press continue too many times, yes. Uh, so GDB lets you reverse execute uh, to some limited extent. Um, there is a more powerful uh, reverse debugger called RR. Uh, yeah, it's under... Taking a while. It's called RR, right? Um, by Mozilla. Um, so the, prob the, the, the reason that I'm not <laughs> demoing it today is because they don't really support AMD processors yet. Uh, right? And um, yeah, so... Yeah, and for one thing, my, my computer is running on AMD, so I can't exactly demo RR. Uh, but there is this tool called RR that you can use um, if you are running on an Intel processor. And uh, they have, uh, I think, they now have some uh, beta or alpha support for uh, AMD uh, Zen processors. Uh, so it's like, uh, it's basically like a GDB's uh, reverse execution, but uh, more powerful. So that's GDB, right? So I talked about yeah, run program, start program, continue, show, backtrace, uh, jump frames, uh, set breakpoints, delete breakpoints, yeah, and so on and so forth, yeah, and yeah, record and reverse. So record, you can actually um, run it uh, at any point, right? You don't have to run it at exactly uh, at the start of the, at the entry point, you can run it at any point because when you start recording, it's going to slow down the execution of your program because it has to rec uh, record everything, right? Um, so you might want to just record uh, when you know that you're nearing the bug but before the bug, right? And you can record and then you can uh, let the bug happen then hit um, some execute, uh, hit an exception or a breakpoint and after you can reverse execute from there. So that's GDB. Um, yeah, let's move on. Okay, uh, now let's look at um, some other tools. So we are now going to move on to uh, basically some static, uh, di basically program checking tools, right? Um, yeah. So one of them is called Valgrind. Valgrind, Valgrind is like a suite of uh, dynamic checkers and profilers. Um, uh, what we're going to look at today is basically Valgrind's uh, primary tool called MemCheck. Um, this was his first tool, right? Uh, there are other tools in Valgrind called uh, Hellgrind and DRD, uh, as well as, I think there are a few newer tools as well, you can go and check. Uh, but this is the most common one. Uh, Hellgrind and DRD are used to detect race conditions in, um, or synchronization errors in uh, multi-threaded programs, right? Um, so if you're writing you know, synchronization code, it may or may not be useful. Uh. Um, it doesn't detect everything, um, and it makes your program run much slower, so it may not be that useful to check. Uh, but the tool is there, la, so in case you need to check for, in case you don't know, you know, you're debugging something and you don't know what's going wrong, um, it's, you can just run it and see if it detects anything la, that you may, that they may be, or may not be of help, right? Um, same applies for mem, uh, for memcheck or Valgrind's default tool. La. Um, it doesn't detect every possible memory error, um, but, you know, you if you're debugging something and you don't know what's wrong with it, uh, you can use memcheck to just maybe it'll print a hint for you or something like that. Or yeah, uh, people always run. People also run memcheck just to um, how to say like just verify that their program, uh, you know, doesn't have any memory errors, right? Or they are detectable by Valgrind lah. But you know, if your Valgrind clean, it's already pretty good la. Okay, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna debunk this program. So again, uh, we can copy it um uh, into our your favorite editor. Uh, okay. 
And um, yeah, so I'm just gonna um, compile it. Oops. Just gonna compile it and you can run it. So if I do dot slash VG, right? Uh, so if you look at Valgrind not C, um, you can see we have our yeah, we have our array and then we are just making a copy of the array on the heap, right? And then we're printing it out, but then for some reason we get this garbage value, right? So um what's the issue there, right? So um I mean okay, it's obvious that this is the issue, but we can have Valgrind to tell us what the issue is, right? So I'm just gonna save Valgrind. Right. And Oh, actually, there are multiple issues in this program, so uh, Valgrind will tell us. So the first issue here is that, um, yeah, so you can see memcheck. So the first issue here is that uh, there is a conditional jump or move that depends on uninitialized values. Right? So what is an uninitialized value? Basically, it's this. Mm. Yeah. So we forgot to initialize i, and so this is actually uh, un undefined behavior like, because it could be any value, right? So um, Valgrind will tell us that yeah, a, you have this problem, right? And then next, it tells us that we have uh, uninitialized values, or we're using some uninitialized values at line eight. Um, sorry, off size eight, at line ten, right? Uh, that probably the index as well, right? Um, and then next, it tells us that there is an invalid. So after that, it prints um. It prints five four three two one, and then after that we get an invalid read. So that is um, after uh, after this is printed, we get an invalid read of size four, right? And it tells us that this is zero bytes after a block of size twenty um, allocated. Um, so what is this actually? This is when we when i equals to five, right? And we access this. That's when we have our access after the. Yeah, so we are accessing the end of this, uh, past the end of this allocated block, right? So Valgrind is telling us that. Yeah, and we also actually, um, we also actually leak memory. So uh, at the end, Valgrind will tell you, uh, will tell you we have some uh, lost memory or leak memory, and then it will also tell us um, we have some initialized, uninitialized values here. So if we do this. Uh, if we specify these flags, then we can Valgrind will give us more information about the errors. La. So again, I run again. And um, okay. so we have our program there. And uh, let me just. Uh, so we have our conditional jump, right? And it depended on the uninitialized value. And it tells us that this uninitialized value was created by a stack allocation, right? So, yeah. so yeah, it's telling us that the 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 what's that? This value comes from the stack of um, this function, right? Which is actually this value, lah. I mean, it won't be able to tell us exactly where, um, or which line that this was declared because the compiler usually allocates um, the compiler usually allocates a space for all. Uh, local variables uh, up front, right, when you um, enter the function. So Valgrind will just tell us that it comes from this function, right? Because uh, if you are passing this value down to other functions, then, um, you know, um, at least Valgrind can tell you exactly which function it came from, and then you can go there and look at uh, where you forgot to initialize something. Like. Then here, yeah, so this is all the same. Um, and at the end here, it tells us that yeah, now we have information about our memory leak, right? So it tells us that we lost uh, twenty bytes. Uh, there was allocated. Uh, there were allocated at line seven, which is this line, right? So you can see here, uh, we indeed forgot to, uh, we forgot to free this uh, block of memory, lah. So we can go in and fix. Uh, we can go in and fix this. So let's fix the bug. So first bug is this uninitialized um uh, variable value right the second bug is this uh, less than or equal to it should just be a strictly less than and the final bug is um we forgot to free right so let's free the array let me just add in a return zero for good measure right and now we can compile 
again. And if we run Velgrind again, yeah, you can see that we have no errors and no memory leaks. Yeah, so we are clean. La. So mm, if you're writing a C or C program, it's always good to be what we call memory um well, memcheck clean, right? In the sense that you run it under memcheck and it doesn't produce any uh yeah, and any errors. La. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So that is Velgrind. So actually the output is I also have it in the slides now, so you can see. Okay. Now we're going to look at address sanitizer, right? Um it's a so a sanitizer is basically a a, a checker that is built into the compiler. Um how it works is basically you specify a flag at compile time, right? And then the compiler is going to basically um the the, the code that the compiled binary will basically have some uh it will be it will have some checks uh, built into it. Um, so the checks are the, the checks are not always uh, compiled in because like they uh I mean uh, they number one they modify the behavior of the program slightly. Number two is they have some overhead. So of course you don't want them in your normal program, right? So you just use this uh, when you want to, you know, verify um uh, yeah, that your 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 program is uh, clean uh, from whatever errors. So address sanitizer detects some of what memcheck detects, right? It detects some buffer overflows, it detects some um use of a free um use after return or use after end of scope, right? And memory leaks. So we can see um yeah, we can just give it a try. Lah. So we're gonna debug the same program under ASEN. Um so to in order to use address sanitizer basically you need to use uh this flag, right? Uh depending on your architect depending on your architecture and your system, you may have to use these flags as well. So basically uh, if you don't run uh if you don't compile with this, right, uh ASEN will complain uh because of certain uh, address based conflicts are basically uh, which I won't go into detail, but basically it'll just tell you to use this. So you can use this and then um if you specify this at the compile, uh, on your compile command line, then it will work fine. Okay, so I'm going to compile um, the program again. Right, and now if I run, oh, wait, I need to unfix my program. Right, uh, because well, remember we fixed the program, so. So let me now unfix the program, right? And now we are compiling with address sanitizer on, right? So dot slash vg, and it will complain to me that, uh, hey, you have a heap buffer overflow, right? Which is the same thing that um, Velgrind complained to us about. So uh, what is a heap buffer overflow? Basically, we read past the end of a buffer that we allocated, right? And again, just like what... Um, Valgrind told us about in this case, it told us that we are trying to access this address, uh, which is uh, zero bytes after a 20 byte region that we allocated, right? Which is, yeah. So, again, we allocated this, which is, uh, this is 20 bytes, right? So, we are trying to access immediately after the buffer, which is what it's telling us. So that's a problem, right? And then now it tells us, uh, so what, what does all this mean, right? Uh, basically, um, this is a representation of the uh, our memory space, right? It's telling us that what we are, it's telling us what we are able to access and what we cannot access, right? So if you, um, if you have FA, uh, it means that that is some address that you cannot access, right? Um, if you have zero zero, that represents eight bytes. Uh, eight bytes that you can access. Um, if you have uh, zero, yeah. So this and eight bytes, right? And then you have four means that you can access four bytes, right? So basically, if you have one means you can access one byte, two byte, three byte, four byte, five byte, six byte, seven bytes, and eight bytes. So in this case, we have uh, eight bytes, eight bytes, and four bytes, which corresponds to our allocation of twenty. Um, 20 bytes, la, right? And we are trying to access uh, past, we're accessing the part of this 8 bytes that we are 
not allowed to access because it's past the end of our allocation. Right? So that is address sanitizer. So, okay. So, actually, I'll talk about this in a bit. So the other uh, the other sanitizer that I want to introduce is called um, UB Sun or Undefined Behavior Sanitizer, right? Um, so it detects uh, certain you know uh, certain undefined behavior. So if you're wondering what undefined behavior is, it's basically things that are listed as undefined uh, according to the C standard, right? So what does it mean for something to be undefined? It means that um, doing that is uh, the, the the behavior that you get from doing a particular undefined operation is basically uh, well, the compiler can do anything that it thinks uh, is best. So, yeah. so some people say that it can um, you know uh, it can like make your it can cause your house to burn down and things like that, right? Um, yes, technically that is uh, legal under the definition of undefined behavior because it's actually it's literally undefined. La, so the compiler can do anything. Right? Uh, of course that's not what actually happens. La. Uh, I mean uh, what usually basically you might see, um, if you have optimizations turned on, you might see like um, you might see some strange uh, errors or uh, you know, you might see some strange behavior if you have undefined behavior. Like for example, um, if you access past the end of an array of a stack array, right, and the compiler can tell that you have done that, right, then the compiler might just assume, uh, like the compiler can assume that okay. Uh, since you're accessing past the end of the array, uh, this is undefined behavior. And once you have undefined behavior in like a function, right, uh, then the whole function is actually undefined, right? So the compiler can say, okay, that means this whole function does nothing because it's undefined behavior, right? Uh, that is something it could potentially do, mm. Typically, that doesn't happen, la, but it's undefined behavior, right? That is what could happen. Okay. Uh, so let us look at uh. UB Sun. Uh, before that, I just want to mention, um, yeah, over here I actually enabled optimizations and the reason is that uh, these sanitizers also sort of depend on some of the optimization passes uh, to generate the sanitizing code. Uh, so um, if you don't have optimization enabled, then it may not be able to detect anything, right? So you should just enable O1. You don't have to enable O2. Just enable O1 will do. And same applies for UB Sun. Okay, so for UB Sun, we're going to debug this program. Um, so, okay, before we actually debug this program, can anyone see uh, where is the undefined behavior in this program? Anyone? Okay, if not, uh, we will just wait for Ubisoft to tell us. Okay, like, actually, if you go to the next slide, <laughs> yes, that is one. There is one more. I mean, if you go to the next slide, then the output from UBSUN is there, right? So then we have, oh yes, the output of UBSUN is here. So I'm just going to copy this. Right. And we can run. Again, we have the same arguments as before. So in this case, now it's instead of uh, sanitize address, we're going to sanitize undefined, undefined behavior, right? And Again, yeah. so now we can just run UBSUN and then it tells us, okay, so again, uh, we have our program here. So it tells us at line five, we have a load of misaligned address, right? So this is this, right? Um, so when you access a, when you access a value, it has to be aligned uh, according to its, uh, 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 its size, right? So um, int is four bytes, so it requires four byte alignment. Right, and so this is actually undefined behavior. Um, on x86 it works, right? But it may not work on, um, yeah, it may not work on any other, um, what do you call it? It may not work on other uh, other architectures, yeah. And the other undefined behavior is basically this, right? Um, we are shifting by bytes five, uh, which is actually this byte. Uh, this byte is 0 times 2, 0, which is 32. Right? And you cannot shift. Uh, uh, for The shift uh, for a 32-bit type can be 0 to 31 at most. right? Uh, 
cannot be 32. So this is undefined behavior as well. Although um, on x86, you'll probably just get zero, lah, which is what we get here. Yeah, so there's a lot of different kinds of undefined behavior, but this is just some examples of undefined behavior, uh, which you may or may not, um, what do you call it? You may not catch on your, you know, in your program or when you're programming, right? Um, so, and yeah. And the other thing is that, you know, usually unbehind behavior, sorry, usually undefined behavior is uh, if the compiler can detect it at compile time, right, uh, then it will, it will emit a warning. Lah. So if I do this, 5 left shift 32, and I compile it again, it will actually tell me immediately, right, uh, left shift count more than uh, width of type. So this is actually, so when you have compiler warnings, and, and then usually I will, ex, I will encourage you to, uh, turn on warnings all in the warnings extra. So if you have a compiler warning that is usually signif uh, usually means that you have undefined behavior uh, um, except for like I mean things that are obviously not uh, undefined behavior like uh, like if you have unused variables that's not undefined uh, but it just means that you may have a bug uh, because you have a variable but you didn't use it right but other warnings are usually uh, indicative of um, undefined behavior. But that, it can only catch it. It can only catch some undefined behavior at uh, compile time. So the rest of it, um, well, not the rest of it, but it can catch more of it at runtime. Uh, it cannot catch all, uh, right? You 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 just have to make sure your program behaves correctly. But with these, with compile time warnings and uh, sanitizers, you can catch a good chunk of uh, potential bugs before you know they cause issues, right? Okay, so this is Ubisoft. And yeah, so this is what this was what I was going to talk about just now. Basically, why would we use Velgrind um, instead of uh, ASUN and UBSUN, right? Basically, Velgrind, the way Velgrind works is it is essentially uh, de um, in a way translating your program into a architecture independent uh, bytecode, right? Doing transformations on the bytecode to yeah, generate the checks, and then after that, it will compile the program back into your architecture and then run it. So this incurs uh, the, the recompilation itself just causes a 4 to 5 times slowdown uh, if I remember correctly so it's just single digit slowdown but then um, the checks that um, the checks that memcheck uh, adds right uh, causes another you know 10 to 10x slowdown or so right so overall it's about a 20 to 30x slowdown if you are using Valgrind uh, but on the other hand if you use ASAN or UBSAN um yeah, it only incurs a few times like, like 2, 3, 4 x slowdown instead of like 20 to 30 x. So, mm, but Velgrind can detect more memory errors than ASUN, I would say. Um, but it, it incurs a lot more slowdown. Yeah. Why is this a semicolon? I think I meant to have a period here. Yep. So this is why we use um, these two instead of uh, Velgrind. There are other reasons as well. Like if your OS may not, your architecture may not have Velgrind and things like that. Or your more system might not have Velgrind installed. But these are built into the compiler. So it's, uh, if you have the compiler, you will have these uh, unless you disable them and, or your compiler has it disabled for whatever reason. Right. Yep. Okay. Um, so we are done with the sort of checkers. Um, now we are going to look at some tools to basically we look at other tools that can let you see the behavior of a program, right? Um, so S trace is what we call uh, well traces uh, system calls, right? So what is a system call? A system call is basically something that uh it is a it's a request that your program makes to a uh, the operating system uh. Um, so it's like a function call except the function is within the operating system. So when you do things like open a file, read a file, um, whatever, what else do you do? Um, request for more memory, right? Um, um, network requests, uh, inter-process communication, access to the GPU, things like that. These are all done through system calls, right? So if you trace the system calls, you can have a good idea of, um, you can see what's happening, uh, what the program is doing. And sometimes you can debug uh, issues using S-Trace, like, because S trace will tell you if a system call returns with an error. And so 
then you can look at that and decide whether that error is a problem or not. Right. So let us um, let's just S trace cat, right? So I'm just gonna S trace cat, like cat the you know the actual file, the the tool, like the shell utility cat, and then uh, I'm gonna pass it a non-existent file, right? And then we're gonna run it. So you can see lots of output, right? So what does this output mean? So we start off with the exec ve uh, cat. Um, this is basically S trace uh, executing cat, right? Um, yeah. So this is a path to cat that it found, and then. Uh, Um, yeah, these are the arguments that were. This is your command line, right? So, uh, which corresponds to the command line that we passed here. Uh, cat, non existent file. And then, uh, this is this is basically the initialization done by the C standard library. So, it's going to set up the heap. Um, it's going to check out. Oh, this is the dynamic linker and stuff. So, our actual program doesn't start executing for quite a while. This is all just uh, initialization of the C. Um, heap, C stack, dynamic linking and things like that. I have only ever used shell check. <laughs> so it's yeah doing all the setup, right? And we only actually get to our uh yeah we only actually get to our uh, what do we call that to cat itself when we are Uh, here, right? Yeah. Uh, probably here lah, somewhere earlier, because cat um the GNU cat is quite complicated. So like it does some it check it, it has to set up locale stuff and this and that, right? So somewhere around here is when we actually start uh executing cat itself, and then over here it will set up a locale yeah you know, look up the locale and things like that, and then uh yeah. And over here, it tries to open our file that, or tries to open a file that I told it to open, right? You can see open it. Um, so open it just lets you specify a directory uh, to consider this, uh, like for, to, re to resolve the relative path, right? So in this case, it's telling it to resolve with the current working directory, find a file, uh, find a path called non-existent file. And then we're going to open it, read only. And of course, this returns um, e no ent, which is no entry. Right, because that file doesn't exist. So then after that it's going to write uh, to standard error, right? It's going to write to standard error cat non existent file. Um, and then it's going to look up the locale database for the error message corresponding to this, which is this. Right, and you can see the output actually here like this is actually the output um of cat interleaves with the output of s trace right yep. and here as well you can see this slash n actually got output here like this is the slash n line over here yep. so this is s trace right so um there are some flags you can look at to s trace so um if you open up the man page for s trace um some you can filter by syscall you can filter by groups of syscalls um sometimes you want to um, follow Fox, right? Um, when I say Fox, means that if you want to follow child processors of whatever program, then you might use dash f. Uh, and um, what else? Yes. So this is the filtering, right? Uh, this one is quite useful. So sometimes you just want to look at um, like file accessors, for example. Then you can just do things like. Um, Um, then we are then it filters it to only uh, syscalls that um include paths in them, right? Um, so that yeah. So then if you are if like for example you know that uh, the issue might be related to a certain uh, a file related issue, then maybe you want to filter for um only these syscalls, right? So you can see we have much less output la. Then you can just find this line for example if this is the problem, right? Um, some other uh. Some other filters that are useful is the uh, this one. Basically, if you just want to check for failed syscalls, so 
yeah, in this case, we are we will only output um failed syscalls, which is here, right? So everything that's successful, we don't care. We just want to look at errors, right? Uh, then this filter might come in useful. So this is uh, S trace. Okay, let's move on. Um, now there is a tool called L-Trace. So what is L-Trace? Basically, it's a library called Tracer. Um, it works, it, you, you run it similarly to S-Trace. Um, yeah, except, yeah, it's, it's called L-Trace instead of S-Trace. So uh, what does L-Trace do, right? Um, S-Trace traces system calls. Um, L-Trace traces library calls, meaning like, um, it only works for programs that are dynamically linked. La. Um, what is a dynamically linked program? That means if you do if you do this, then it will if you do LDD and then a program and it prints out some stuff here, that means it's a dynamically linked, a dynamically linked program, right? Uh, that means it will reference uh, these SO files, la, shared objects. Mm. If you yeah, if you represent if you try um, so L-Trace won't work for things like BusyBox, which are not dynamically linked, right? Because all the calls are basically internal to that um, particular uh, executable. Uh. Yeah. Uh, in that case, you know, um, you can possibly use GDB instead of, yeah, to, to look at what the program is doing, uh, but it's not as convenient, right? Uh, you don't get a nice log or things like that. LDD is basically... Uh, I will say LDD stands for uh, LD debugger. I don't know. Um, if you come from the Windows world, um, then you might know these things of like DLL files. Um, right. So in Linux, DLL files are equals like uh, shared object files. And these are basically linked uh, like library libraries that are linked at uh, runtime. Uh, yeah, and so uh, for libraries that are linked at runtime, um, you can use Ltrace to look at the calls that are being made, la, basically. Uh, okay, so let's actually, yeah, so DLL stands for dynamic link library, and SO stands for shared object, right? Uh, it's just, it's a different name for the same thing. La. DLL is the Windows name, SO is like, um, the Unix name. Okay, Google says list dynamic dependencies. I guess that works too. Okay, so um, let's trace this program, right? Uh, yeah, so we can just. Oh, okay. I probably forgot to escape the. I forgot to escape the SCDIO. Let me just fix that. Okay, so remind me to fix this in the slides. But uh, there we go. Uh, so this is a program. If you're copying and pasting it, uh, please fix it. Uh, yeah. Uh, the the include, the actual include file is missing. Okay. So let us uh, L trace this program. Right. And right, so um, yeah, basically, you can see that our printf actually got compiled into a puts by the compiler. And yeah, that, that's how this program does. So it just calls puts, right? Um, now, if you are running certain distributions like Arch Linux, for example, um, uh, you might find that Ltrace doesn't work for things like for certain uh, for, for, for packages that come from the Arch repository. So if I try Ltrace uh, echo, you might find that it doesn't actually do, like it doesn't list any library calls. 
Uh, the reason for this is if you look at if you look at uh make page um make package .conf in Arch right um the default flex that all Arch packages are compiled with has this line here or this flag here which is f no plt right um so the problem with this is that ltrace depends on the plt um, in order to intercept calls and you can go and google if you want to know what a plt is and so um, as an optimization right arch disables the plt and so uh, ltrace doesn't work right. um yeah so i will not be able to demonstrate this because it uh I'm, i will not be able to demonstrate ltrace on echo that's why i have a i, I demonstrated ltrace on a separate program uh, but if you use a different distribution uh, that doesn't have this uh, compile flag for all its packages, then you might be able to ltrace echo and then see the output from there. Yeah. But this is the idea of ltrace. Uh. So instead of tracing system calls, it traces calls to libraries, which include the standard library, uh, C standard library. So you can see things like it calling printf or fopen and things like that, instead of it calling um, write, which are system calls, right? Okay, um, yeah, let's move on from here. So l yes. So again, this is the output of the Hello program, which is actually interleaved with the output from l Okay. Yeah, so I mentioned it here. So there is an alternative to l that works with certain programs that uh, that have this optimization so if i you can use this thing called uh uf trace which is available in the in debian and ubuntu uh, ubuntu repositories although for ubuntu and debian i think ltrace itself just works uh, because like the ubuntu um, and debian i believe they do not compile their packages with this optimization right uh, but i can show you uh, so i can l So the issue is that I, I also could not get UF trace to I also could not get uh, UF trace to actually work on uh, the echo for some reason, but I managed it, it seems to work on bash, so I can show you it working on bash. So you can see basically all the different kinds of uh, library calls that bash is making as it starts up. So it's basically checking um, the environment, right? Doing string comparisons and things like that. Um, then it's setting up its uh, shell built-in table and other stuff, right? Um, so all of these are, of course, C standard library calls, right? And all the way at the bottom, you can see it uh, execute our command, which was uh, echo, right? And then it printed. It printed hello. Okay, if you have Ubuntu, you might be able to provide an L trace for us. <laughs> yeah, it's probably way too long. Um, it's okay. If you are on Ubuntu, you can give it a try and see what the output of L trace on like a, a simple command like echo is. Yeah. Um, but it should look something like this. Uh, basically, it gives you all the different library calls that it makes um, instead of system calls. So you can see exactly what the program is doing. Yep. So that is ltrace and uftrace. uftrace is actually quite, I think it's a quite a powerful tool. Um, that it can do other things as well. I didn't really get to explore it. Yeah. Okay, so a uh, summary of the debugging section and I look, seems like I'm severely behind time. Um, we talked about the PDB and GDB. So um, yeah, two debuggers. And then we talked about some checkers for compiled languages, uh, Velgrind, ASAN, UBSAN. Um, so the reason I put compiled languages here is you don't really need these for non-compiled languages like JavaScript or whatever, or like even .NET or Java because those manage memory for you. So you won't actually have leaks. Okay, you can have memory leaks on Java, but you cannot, you can't really detect those using Velgrind, right? You have to use Java specific tools to detect uh, yeah, memory leaks in Java. And then there are other some general more general tools that you can use. 
um, S trace, L trace, UF trace. These can be used even for like Java or .NET programs because they they also make system calls, right? Um, they also make library calls. So, yeah. so this is a summary of uh what we just covered. Okay. Okay, let's move on to uh, the profiling section. Okay. Um, so the first tool that we're going to look at is just time, right? It's just a cell built in, right? I can do time. And basically, it's going to run. Uh, it's just going to run the program that I specify and then tell me the time that it took to run the program, right? So um, instead of timing this, let's time a program that uh, takes some time, right? So again, we're going to copy this into our file and then let's compile it, right? Um, I'm going to enable optimizations this time because otherwise it's going to take way too long. Um, I mean, we can adjust the number, but you know. Okay, so now I'm going to time uh, 1000, right? So you can see, uh, okay, the output here is just the output here is just um, whatever nonsense value that I'm printing out here. So we can ignore the output, but what we want to look at is the time here. Uh, the recording will be on YouTube. Uh, basically, uh, you can look out on our public channels. I will send a message when the recording is uploaded. So again, we run time, and it will tell us how long it took to um, sorry. Yeah, it, it will tell us how long it took to run the program and so on. So what does what do all these values mean, right? So um, this is actually the uh, what we call that. Let's run it for longer. This is the real time that was taken, right? Um, so this is the uh, so-called, yeah, this is real time as in like clock time. So like real world time that was taken. This was the amount of time that is spent, uh, CPU time in user space that was that is spent. And this is the amount of uh, CPU time in uh, the kernel that is spent. So basically, this is the time that the kernel used to fulfill um, system calls. Uh. In this case, we don't really have any system calls except here. Uh, there will be a write call here, so um, but this is like negligible. Uh. So um, time is a very, uh, I mean, it's a useful but easy, simple but useful tool. Basically, you can use it to do simple benchmarking. So like if you combine this with the shell for statement, you can just like do benchmarking. Uh, you know, you can benchmark your thing for whatever reason you need to. Uh. So like uh, here, let's say I want to benchmark my time program. Uh, so you, you usually run it for like a few t iterations. And usually the first few you will ignore because it's like a warm up. So let your CPU warm up and let your, um, yeah. Whatever, if your program does like file accesses and things like that, then you might you want to let your disk cache warm up. Yeah. Then you might want to ignore the first few iterations and then you look at the rest. And then you can see, okay, so for this, uh, this configuration, 10,000 iterations, takes about 0 0.28 to 29 seconds, right? Yeah. And yeah, yeah. So that is time. Very simple tool. Um, so your 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 output may differ. So like if you um if you run bash, right? Uh, then time might look like this instead. But it's the same la. So this is a if you're running bash, then this corresponds to this. Right, the real corresponds to the ZSH total. Um, user is this, system is this. Sorry, sorry, user is this, this, is this, and this corresponds to this. Yeah, so this is the bash output. Uh, but anyway, I do not use bash. No, users plus system is not real. Uh, this is like the actual uh real time. Uh. Okay, uh, user plus this is approximately real if your program is single core. That means it doesn't use more than one thread. If your program is multi-threaded, then uh, no. Uh, it may not be equal to real. It may be more than real. Yeah. 
Okay, now let us look at perf. So, perf is a very, very, uh, it's a tool that can do many, many things. Uh, it's also a very, uh, it's, also, it's also very useful, of course. Uh, it's quite, it's a low overhead tool and you can do, you can use it to measure, you can use it to do a lot of things. So you can measure performance of your program, you can measure performance of the whole system, you can measure the kernel, and so on. Uh, it's a Linux tool, like it's, it's sort of built with the kernel. Um, so, yep. Let's look at perf. So let's profile the uh, program that we just, uh, this, this program, right? So we can just run perf stat. So the first time you run perf, or when you, depending on your kernel setup, um, you might have this issue where you need to, um, yeah. You need to configure it to allow you to use perf, right? So I'm going to do that. So basically I'm going to, right. Um, then once you have done this, you should be able to, uh, run perf, right? And yeah, so perf will tell you, okay, time 50,000. Took, uh, this is the amount of time it took. And um, yeah, then it tells you lots of different other statistics that um, I will not go too much into detail today because this is not a computer, um, this is not a computer hardware or architecture uh, workshop or OS workshop. Um, so these are some statistics, so like context switches, basically how many times it switched, uh, your, your, your program was switched in and out. Um, CPU migration, so how many times your program changed uh, cores or CPUs. Uh, how many page faults were incurred in the execution of your program. Uh, if you want to know what page fault is, um, hopefully you have taken your OS module. Um, yeah. Then we have cycles, this is basically uh, CPU cycles that were incurred uh, that, that were used in the execution of your program. Um, we have stalled cycles. Uh, basically, when you have stalled cycles, it means that your CPU is waiting for something, right? Um, the front end is basically like uh, instruction decoding and things like that. Back end is basically waiting for memory or ex actually executing the program. So um, you can Google if you want to know more about what exactly mm, the front end and back end do. But if you have stalled cycles, it means that um, the CPU is waiting for something. La. So that may not be a necessarily a bad thing. Um, it just depends on like, um, yeah, it, it depends on your program. La. So uh, you have to look at exactly why there are stalled cycles. La. It may not be a problem, right? These are just the number of instructions, CPU instructions that were executed um, while your program is executing, right? This is the number of branches that were made in your, uh, when you're in your, execution of a program. So like um, branches is like uh, if you have an if statement or like uh, like things like this, uh, loops, right? Where at the end of the loop, an iteration you branch, uh, you, you, you branch, yeah, you branch to and check, right? Um, basically, if this condition is met, then you branch uh, and you continue. Otherwise, you branch out of the loop. So that's a branch, right? Uh, and then this is a branch miss. A branch miss is basically when the branch prediction of your CPU fails. Um, so if you have a lot of branch misses, that means your performance is going to be lower lah, because uh, yeah, CPU predicts this, it predicts that this branch will be taken, but end up it's the other branch. So your CPU has to um, basically undo its uh, uh, branch prediction, lah, uh, speculative execution. So, and then this is the same as what we talked about before. So like this is the real time. This is the user time. And this is the system time that was spent. So I don't think it's exactly zero, but it's probably too small for um, perf to actually uh, count. Right? So these are just the default uh, statistics that are recorded by perf. Um, you can actually look at the other uh, possible events or metrics that can be uh, recorded by perf. There are many, many, many of them. Um, yeah, but as a general, you know, if you're just looking at the performance of a program, the default uh, values are probably uh, the default statistics are usually can give you a good enough overview um, of where you might want to focus your um, attention on. Uh, 
Uh, but the other things you might want to look at are like cash misses, which are not included here. Um, you know, things like that. Yep. So that is perf stat. Now look at, let's look at perf uh, record, right? So uh, let me first explain what these mean. So perf, uh, what perf record does is basically will sample your program uh, at a given frequency. So this is a frequency per second. Um, what it does when it samples is basically it will check, uh, you look at where in the program, uh, like which instruction your program is currently executing or, or which instruction is currently being executed, right? Um, and then you just sample as, yeah, at whatever rate you tell it to. Lah. And this will actually, this uh, dash G will also sample the call graph, basically um, to try and figure out uh, like the call stack and also the way that you got to the particular instruction. Um, so what's the use of this uh, sampling is basically you can um, you can you can see how much uh, what are the hotspots in your program like basically so like where uh, where is your program spending most of the time and then there is where you may want to focus your optimization if you are trying to make your program fast right so again we can profile our time yes and you may get this error so I'm just going to um, So if you get this error, basically it means that it cannot read the kernel symbols or address maps for security reasons. Um, so you can just set uh, zero to this uh, kernel, um, what you call that, uh, parameter, right? And yeah. And let us do that again. Yeah. So we record, right? And Perf tells us it was uh, we've gone up a few times to read data, uh, write data, and then it captured our data to perf.data. This is the default file name, right? And now you can look at a uh, Perf report. Right? So if you open up Perf report, you get a bunch of things like this, right? Um, yeah. So what does all this mean? Basically, um, how do I say? Uh, it, it tells you exactly where time was spent, right? Uh, in the execution of your program, right? Even if it um, so if your program, if you handle a uh, interrupt in your program, you also know that, right? But what we want to focus on is our program, right? So we can just look at um, main, right? Kind of, and then um, so you can just press enter, right? You can just press enter, and then you uh, you go you go into this menu, right? And then um. And type annotate main, right? Once you do that, it will look at the, it will bring you to the assembly, um, what's your, what do you call it? Yeah, this assembly of your main method or main function, sorry. Um, and yeah, then it will tell you that, it will show you the hotspots in that particular function. La. So 89% um, of the time, um, your program spent in the main function um, was spent uh, in doing this instruction, right? Which kind of makes sense. Lah. Um, we are, yeah, this is adding i times j to c, right? Yeah. So then maybe you want to optimize uh, this line. Of course, uh, in this case, this is expected. Lah. We expect the program to spend most of the time there because this is the body of our loop, right? So then you can use this to sort of, um, you know, just see where the hotspots in your program are and focus your efforts in uh, optimization there. Right. You can also do this. Uh, oops. Yeah, hierarchy, right? And then instead of showing you all the different ones, it will just show you in the, what do you call that, as a, based on the call stack. So, oops. Let me press plus. So in order to expand this, you can just press plus. Like the, um, right. So shift equals, right? You get plus. And you can plus, plus. So we want to ex annotate main, right? Uh, so this is the same as just whether you want it to show everything or you just want it you want to show it in a tree format. Right, then you can annotate main and you see the same stuff, right? So that is uh, perf report hierarchy. Okay. So uh let us 
So just now our program. Whoops. Uh, our program, well, it didn't really um like it just did some computations, right? So it doesn't make any system calls. Um so yeah, so let us uh, look at a program that actually uh makes system calls, right? Okay, so again, I'm going to uh, paste the program and we're going to compile it with uh, this and then I'm going to, let's run perfstat on it. This program takes a bit longer. Yep, so it took about 10 seconds. And uh, yeah, so we have number of uh, contact switches as usual, but here we have a lot more backend cycles uh, stalled. So that means the CPU was waiting for something. And uh, if we now look at a uh, perf uh, record, if we use perf record and let it run again. Now we can go into perf report, right? And uh, you will see, let's go into main. You will see that it didn't actually spend a lot of time in main, right? Uh, right. It, it didn't spend a lot of time in main, it actually spent a lot of time doing a read, right? Um, so then uh, if you want, then we can look at our program. And where are we doing a read? Uh, we are doing read here. So actually it spends most of its time reading. Mm, yeah. So then you might want to optimize the read. La. And how do you actually, you know, um, yeah. and the other way you can actually um, visualize data from perf is using this tool called flame graph, right? Um, so yeah. the tool is located here. Um, it's actually written in Perl, which is why I asked you to install Perl. But uh, your system probably has Perl installed with it. La. I, I, yeah, most, most Linux systems have Perl uh, pre-installed. So how do we um, generate a flame graph? Right? Basically, you first want to export the perf output into some uh, into a format that flame graph can understand. Right? So we use perf script for that. Then after that, you're going to have to this script is from these three scripts are from uh, flame graph itself. So uh, I'm going to use um uh, yeah the path you have to specify the path to flame graph of course in this case mine is dot pearl right um and you just redirect the output to whatever file name and then next you can just run flame graph on that uh output and then you get um an SVG file which you can open in your browser. So I already have the SVG graph um generated and embedded in the slide so you can actually play around with it um, yeah you can see that this is actually an uh, interactive svg right uh, it is uh, profiling this program right um, so let's see so main is all the way over here it didn't spend much time in main itself uh, it's already spent most of the time doing read and so you can see that um, so it spent like uh, basically ninety nine percent of the time in the of the program was spent um, within like uh, this function, which spent most of its time in this function. So ninety two percent of all the, uh, the 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 time in the program was spent in this function, which is extract CRNG, which makes sense because we are reading from U random, right? Yeah, and then like okay, and then over here we can see that uh, it was spent in this function, which is like. Cha 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 is a, a stream cipher algorithm which is used in a random number generation as well, right? Yeah. And uh, the other thing to note is of course that these are all within the kernel. So uh, read onwards, right? This this is a GC uh, sorry a C library function, but after this is all uh, within the kernel already. So like all these are kernel functions, uh. Yeah. So there's slim graph. This is what you get from this, and you can actually do, uh, if you do. If you do this, you specify reverse, right? What you get is uh, reversing, you, you reverse the stack trace. Uh, 
Um, so if you, this one gives you like a breakdown of like, okay, so most of the time was spent uh, within the read this call and where the read, where did this read this call um, spend its time and so on. Um, if you reverse the stack trace, what you get is instead this. So like you see um, where the time, which function actually spent uh, or used up most of the time. So you can see that, oh, actually, um, right. Uh, so, oops. So over here it says extract CX, CRNG is actually 92% of the time, right? Uh, but the 92% includes the 14% of time that was spent in uh, Chacha block generic, right? Uh, over here, if you reverse it, then uh, so this 77% of the time is the time actually spent by extract CRNG doing whatever it is, uh, and then like the time spent by Chacha, you know, permute is actually um 13% of the time, right? So then you can you can see where the time is being spent in your program. Now. So this is flame graph and perf, right? Okay, and finally, um, this, this tool I didn't um, actually mention in the, um, in the uh, prerequisites list, but uh, you can go and download it. Uh, I'm just going to demo it. It's basically a uh, overpowered time, right? Uh, uh, like the time shell command, right? Um, so let me just demo it to you. Like it's, otherwise, it works. I mean, you use it in a similar way as the shell time command. Yeah, so basically, it helps you benchmark stuff. Right? And um, so what is this s bash? Basically, telling you, uh, I'm telling it to run this command using bash. And then this w3 just says uh, run three warm up rounds, right? So this is cool. And you can also do things like this. So like um, I can have a parameter count, right? And then count will, I want count to range from 10,000 to 50,000. And uh, I want it to, uh, I want the step to be 10,000 each time. So that means this is going to run time uh, from like 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, and 50,000, right? So I can just uh, run it and then it will do the benchmark for me. And uh, yeah, we'll let it run. And uh, in the meantime, I will just say like uh, so. Um, Hyperfine lets you do like it helps you yeah run a benchmark la. Um, and you can measure the time. And then like uh, there's also some options to let it export to CSV and whatever. So if you want to yeah, then you can export. You can automate the benchmarking la. Um, so if you're taking any module like uh, let's say three two one zero, then you might want to use this. Um. So um, once it finishes, then you can see, okay, so uh, it will provide you a summary. So like, uh, so it tells you that 10,000 ran about two times faster than 20,000, three times faster than 30,000, and, and so on. So it all makes sense. Yeah, and it gives you some variance and things like that. Yep. So this is Hyperfine. And Hyperfine is written in Rust. Just, just to see. Okay. So that is the summary for CPU profiling. Oh, it's really 825. Okay, the last section should be a lot faster because it's just a system monitoring. Um, yeah. So what we talked about is time and hyperfine, right? Um, these are just tools you can use to measure how long it takes for a program to run. Then we had perf, which shows you a lot of, which can show you a lot of things like um, hardware counters, so like the context switches, uh, uh, stalled cycles, things like that. And then there's flame graph, which helps you visualize um, uh, some of perf's output, right? Okay, that was profiling. Okay, last section. Oh, okay, before that. Okay, so uh, the tools that we mentioned here, right, they're all language agnostic, right? Uh, that means that they work for any, yeah, any language, but uh, of course, uh, you, can, you can also use them for these languages, but um, Depending on what you want to profile, it may be better to use the uh, tools specific to those languages. So like Python has its own profiler. I'm sure JavaScript has. Um, there are many profilers for .NET, right? Um, and so on. And there's something that we didn't mention here is also memory profiling, 
right? So like, um, yeah, basically, if you want to uh, measure like what, uh, how much memory your program uses and what is causing that memory usage, then you want to use, you want to do memory profiling. Uh, and that is, um, we won't cover that today, but basically you will use, well, each language will have its own tools. Lah. Yeah. Um, those, those tools are usually language specific. So like for Java memory profilers, you can see exactly where uh, that, or like what objects are causing or using up the memory or actually like what, what, what the memory, sorry, what objects the memory is made of and so on. So that is profiling. Okay, uh, down to the last section of our talk today, which is uh, system monitoring. So actually I put this, um, I would say this is under the profiling section of the talk. Uh, it is so-called system profiling, but not really, right? Um, let's just call it monitoring. Okay, so some of these tools you may already know, right? Um, those tool is called HTOP, right? Um, so what is HTOP? Um, HTOP is a tool to let you view processes on your system as well as like uh, yeah, your CPU and uh, memory usage, uh, yeah, uptime, whatever. You can configure it to show whatever you want, right? So like uh, over here, I can make it show like um, whatever. Uh, this is why I've configured it, uh, but you can make it show like load averages, uptime, battery, task counter, pressure store information, um, yeah, ZFS information, if you use ZFS. And then over here, you can make it, it will show you all the statistics about different processes. So over here, you can have a like a white uh, bird's eye view of what's happening on your system. So like you can see OBS here, which I'm using to record the, the, the talk. Um, it's using about 20% of uh, one CPU, right? So you might see here that this goes above 100%. This is because, um, yeah, 100% means one core. So like if you go above 100%, then uh, it's multi using multiple cores. La. And you can see other things like this is a memory usage, uh, proportional set size, uh, virtual memory usage, shared memory usage, and the PID, and so on, CPU usage, memory, uh, overall memory usage as a percentage, amount of I.O. And um, yeah, this is like the CPU time that it, the program has used uh, since it started. So like uh, this is minutes and seconds. So like over here, Zoom has spent three hours of CPU time. <sighs> and you can of course, you can also go and configure uh, this to show like other columns, like a lot of things you can show, like so you want to see like um, faults or like um, which processor, uh, which core is running on. I'm, I'm using a 2700X, sorry, not, uh, not very, uh, yeah, not very up to date. You can, yeah, there's a lot of information that you can see here, but this is what I have. Uh, I have configured for my HTOP. So HTOP is a useful tool. And you can do things like, uh, so if you press H, you can look at the help for HTOP. And then there are some other things that you can do. For example, you want to, um, yeah, you can launch S trace from HTOP. You can launch, uh, you can use ls off, which I will talk about in a bit from htop and so on. Yeah. So this is htop, useful tool. And what, uh, what uh, useful, I use it to sometimes kill programs also. So you just press F9, you can just kill the program. Right, but I won't do that. Yeah. So this is htop. Yes. Okay. Um, so when would you use htop? Basically, if I would say just to monitor what's going on in your system as well as like um, if like your system is hanging for some reason then you might want to go to htop and like see uh, what is like using up all your CPU or like all your disk um, yeah. and then you can look at this uh, pressure stall information you know yes Zoom is using up all my CPU cool okay IO top so htop shows you uh some information, but uh, if you want a tool specifically to look at a process IO usage, you can use IO top, right? And uh, I need to run it as sudo because security. <laughs> um, so then here you have, you can see all the processes that are doing IO la, and the amount of read and write that they are doing, right? 
Um, so you can actually just use HTOP for this, but uh, IOTOP is just another tool. And there are some flags that I introduced, uh, which is PO. So if you look at the help, um, dash P is to basically only show processes instead of showing all threads, right? And then we have O, which is basically only show threads or processes that are doing IO. So um, if you don't want it to be so cluttered, then you can, um, yeah. So in this case, we only have, yeah. So it only shows the processes that are doing IO and then I can see um, what's going on. Lah. So this is IO top. Okay, uh, dstat. Uh, dstat is a tool that is uh, rather, I guess it's useful. Um, if you are, you know, if you have like those uh, window managers or something that has a, like a panel at the bottom that you can configure, right? You can use dstat to sort of uh, generate the uh, this information, I think. I'm not sure if they do that. But uh, what this does is basically it shows you uh, it's basically an overall view of the system. It's just different formats. So like uh, depending on what you want to use the uh, uh, information for, you will use different tools. So like if you are um, if you are just going in and seeing stuff like on your shell, you can use HTOP because it's interactive. But um, if you want to say log, uh, like create a graph of information. Um, then you maybe you want to use dstat, right? Uh, and then this will just show you some information, so like uh, CPU usage, um, disk usage, network usage, and um, yeah, so on. So there are more things you can see from dstat, so like, yeah, if you enable all the things, then you can see like uh, this CPU usage, disk usage, network usage, page, page file usage, which um, which I'm not using. Um, I don't have a page file, and then we have um, system number of interrupts, number of contact switches, the load average, uh, the number of processes running, um, I/O that's uh, going on on the system, swap, which again in type I don't have a swap file, so there's no paging happening, and uh, yeah, the time. Uh, what happens if your system is so lag that you can't even open HTOP or I/O top? <laughs> uh, then. <laughs> Well, you just restart and hope for the best. Yeah. Okay, uh, free. Uh, you probably know this tool. It's just a tool to view uh, memory usage. So if you just type free, it will tell you the number of um, kilobytes. If you type this H, then it will tell you in uh, human readable units. So like uh, yeah, free, then the memory. Um, so there's total memory, use memory, uh, amount of free memory, amount of shared memory being used amount of memory you use for cache and the amount of actually free memory, right? Yep. So that is free. Okay. Um, now we have a DF. DF is a simple tool. Normally I use DF-H, which is basically human readable again. So again, if you don't have um, uh, if, so if you don't specify dash H, then it's going to specify everything in kilobytes. Um, otherwise, yeah, you get it in uh, human readable units. You can specify dash H, and then it basically shows you all the file systems that you have on your system, um, where they are mounted on, and uh, yeah, the the size, how much space is used, uh, and like uh, yeah, how much space is available. Uh, what about tools showing GPU utilization? Uh, we don't cover that today because um. Yeah, those are specific to this particular um yeah, those are provided by NVIDIA and AMD. Yeah. Uh, you have NVIDIA SMI and like I, I don't know what the AMD one is. Uh honestly the tools for GPUs on Linux are quite don't know, quite um uh what do you call that? Underdeveloped, I would say. Like there's a lot of monitoring tools on Windows, right? On Linux it's just like almost nothing. Yeah. Unfortunately, or for whatever reason, I guess it's not that interesting. Yes, so DMs, VMstat is kind of similar. I mean, it shows you, uh, I mean, yeah. VMstat is also a tool to look at memory, so like you have swap free. Um, yeah. 
mm, buffered. Memory use for buffer, memory use as cache, uh, swap in, swap out, and bytes in, bytes out. Yeah, it looks like, it kind of looks like uh, DSTAT. And I would believe that they may be from the same suite of tools. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, now we have uh, DU, right? So just now we had DF. DF showed you the free space or like of each, in total of each file system. But if you want to drill down into like, um, you know, uh, which directories are using space, then you might use DU. DU stands for disk usage, right? So if you again specify dash H, then it will tell you, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, like the, it will just tell you the total disk usage of his directory. So like, um, so what I like to do is use do like this. If I go to like, um, let's say, Right, and I do, yeah, so and then I do this, and it will tell me, okay, so, um, tells me that uh, this directory, yeah, is using this much space, and so on, and so on. Yeah, and then you can go in and drill down. Um, the other tool that I like to use for this, actually, this thing called ncdu, yeah, which will do the same, except I can sort of navigate down, so like, okay, uh, what in Gen 5, or let's say my presentations folder, what is it, um, what is in my presentations folder, okay, and okay, there's uh, 50 megabytes of node modules, right, and then, um, yeah, 45 megabytes of Git, uh, and so on, yeah. So, yeah, there's DU and CDU. Okay, um, we have uh, Fuser, Fuser. Fuser basically just shows you uh, which processors are using the specified file. So if I do fuser dot, right, it tells me that process uh, five three nine two eight is using the current directory. Uh, it's using this directory as the current directory. So if you want to know what all this means, you can look at the manual page, right? So basically, uh, each file name is followed by a letter denoting the type of access, right? So again, if you use dot, then C stands for, that means this process here is using the current directory as the current directory, right? Or if I do like, uh, yes, then it says, okay, so um, this uh, process is using this process is using this uh, file as, as in this is the current executor being run by this process ID, right? Yeah. So that's F user. As F user has more options, of course. Like so, we can look at it. Uh, right. And then you can see like uh, yeah, the command and so on. Yes. And there is also ls off, right? So ls off is uh. LS off is like a F user, but um, way more powerful. So like uh, LS off just stands for list uh, open files. So like it lists all the open files on the system. Uh, so if I just run LS off, it's going to take a while because it's enumerating all the open files in the system. And I can hear my CPU fans running up. But yeah, so there you have. Um, so it has all the different files that are open in the system. So like my Firefox has like stuff in the profile open. Um, and then like, yeah. So this also lists stuff that are open by file descriptors. Um, so like, uh, yeah. So mostly Firefox stuff first. But um, normally you want to like uh, specify like uh, filters or something. So like you can, as usual, um, look at the manual page for exactly how you want to filter. So like, let's say, um, let's say I want to, again, list the processes that are using the current file. Uh, yeah, so I have ZSH that's using it uh, as the current working directory. And yeah, or I can, So, 
So that is LS off. Yeah. So when we use LS off and fuser, basically if you want to, like for example, you are trying to unmount something but you can't, right? Then people recommend that you use LS off or fuser to figure out what is still using that uh, particular directory or file and oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, like your thumb drive, right? When you try to unmount it, then it tells you something is using it. So that's when you can use user or ls off to uh, figure out what's using uh, yeah, the file or something like that. Yeah. Or yeah, for whatever reason, or if you need to delete, uh, usually you can, on Linux, you are able to unlink stuff. Um, yeah. Um, even if something is using it. Okay. Um, SS. SS is basically socket statistics, right? It just lists um, open sockets. So like, um, you can see like uh, my computer is connected to these uh, servers. I assume this is by Firefox. So like, um, yeah, if you just do that, then you can also see what ports your computer is listening on. So if I just press SS slash L, then uh, yeah, so I can see that my computer is listening on um, these ports. Um, like um, this is my system D resolve D. This is like um, I, I don't know what LLM and R is, but uh, yeah. Um, and if you want to check, if you want to view the numeric uh number ports, then you can uh, specify dash n, right? Um, and then it'll tell you the numeric ports. So, um, the reason. Why will you use this? Basically, if you, you want to check uh, what is using a port, right? Or you can also look at the process as using a port. So like if you just press, uh, if you specify the dash P flag, then it will show you the processors that are um, using the particular, uh, yeah, the particular connection, right? And if you do LP, then you can see what is listening or what. So um, let me just, so let me zoom out a bit because the output is very long. Uh, so you can see here Dropbox is Dropbox is listening to this port. I don't know why it's listening on that port, but it's listening on that port. I guess uh, maybe for its uh, network sync uh, feature or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So this is SS. Uh, basically, you can just view sockets that are open like, and usually you use it to view. Uh, network connections that are open. There are also other tools that do this. Yeah. Um, for me, I use this more often when I'm just checking if something um, like is listening or something is working. So if I'm trying to run like a, a HTTPD, like a Nginx, for example, um, then I would use SS to check um, is Nginx listening on the correct port. You know. Um, yeah, you can use Netstat as well. Netstat is the older version of SS. Uh, SS is like the successor of uh, Netstat. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, this is a summary of the monitoring section, right? Um, I didn't really go in depth into all the tools because I think you, sh um, if you need a tool and you you can you can always go and look at the manual page for all the different options that each tool offers. But um, yeah, it's just good for you to know that these tools exist. So if you need to check something, you can you know uh, what you should try lah. Okay, and uh, last sections. Uh, last section, we have some other tools. So basically, we have stress. Um, if you ever need to stress test your system, uh, oops, right? Uh, you have the stress tool, so you can stress the CPU, you can stress the memory, uh, and you can stress the hard drive, right? And you can stress. Um, I don't know why you would stress sync, but um, I guess it sort of stresses the. Uh, yeah, I mean, it does stress I.O. a bit. Mm. So for whatever reason you need to stress your system, you can always use stress. Um, yeah. So if you want to check like your thermals, uh, you can use stress. Um, for example, or you want to stress test your HDD, or if you just want to create artificial load to test uh, some scripts or test some uh, alarms on your system, things like that, you can use stress. Right. Uh, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to stress my system. But... This is a tool that you can use. Right. 
Um, then there is STUI. Um, this is the tool that I like to use to check my uh, CPU clock rates and stuff, CPU temperatures and whatever. So um, yeah, it tells you your CPU and tells you like other things. So like, and it also has a stress. <coughs> it also has a stress tool built in, so like you can see. Um, if you want to, you can do like thermal stressing of your CPU uh, using this tool, and then you can see how the term the 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 temperature uh, changes lah. And you can enable the UTF-8 uh, option so that your graphs get more granular a bit. Yeah. So then here you get like graphs on like um, the different temperatures on your system. So like this is my CPU temperature. I believe this is the temperature of the motherboard. Something else on the motherboard. And yeah, some other things. Right. And um, then you can look at the different frequencies, the different CPU utilization and your fan speeds. Yeah, depending on what your motherboard supports la. and uh, if you want you can like stress your system and then you can see the temperature start to spike so like yeah I'm gonna turn it off just in case something crashes yeah so you can see <laughs> my CPU stylization going up and the temperature going up and then going down right so this is a tool that you can use okay Finally, we just have these two last tools, which is basically to check your system log. So, um, general CTL, always check the help, right? Um, the flags that I commonly use are like uh, dash K, just to check if I just want to read the kernel log, but it's exactly the same as the message. Um, if I want to, um, I also use dash B, usually. Where is dash B? Uh, Dash boot, right? So I just want to limit uh, the display to the current boot, right? Log, uh, log messages since the current boot. So I can do that. Yeah. And there's also other flags I use, which is uh, dash E. Which, uh, yeah. So I just jump, if I just want to check the most recent uh, entries, I can just dash E and it will jump to the end for me. And then I can do dash F, which is to yeah, like tail the journal. So what I can do. EB and then you can see lots of stuff. So this is all the different system services that are being run by system D. And like you see other things here, so like this. Um, all these are from the kernel log, so like you can view them in D message as well. And then these are other things, so like um, other things that uh do that write to the system log. So if you want, you can actually do syslog. Oops. Uh, actually, yeah, the command is called logger if I'm not wrong. So if I can type, I can type a message here, and then if I later go back to check journal CTL, then it says, yeah, I can. You can also write to the system log. Right? So that command is called logger. So I can do like a uh, right, and then it will print the date in the logger. I mean, yeah. So you can, if you want to write things to the log, you can always use the logger command, and you write it to the log, then you can view it later, lah. Hmm. So that's journal CTL. Um, sometimes you can use dash K. Um, so this will view the kernel log since the current boot. Yeah. So like, yeah, you have these. Um, and here you can see that, oh, yeah. You can see that perf is actually intertwined with the kernel because it uses kernel functionalities to measure stuff. And this was the sec fault that we had earlier. Um, so in order to view the kernel log, the other way is actually just to use the message. Um, yeah, but for me, uh, I need to be root to view the message. So yeah, it's the same. But since I don't need to use sudo to use journal CTL, I just use journal CTL. So that is uh, journal CTL and the message. So when would you use these two tools? Basically, uh, yeah, if you if your system is going haywire and you don't know why, right? Um, how do you troubleshoot that? The first thing you do is look at HTOP. Second thing you do is look at the uh, system journal and see if there's anything going crazy, right? Um, so like if your network is down, for example, most likely your network, um, your network manager, um, whether it's like whatever network manager you use, will probably have some output, um, into the system log, so you can look there and see and see what's going wrong. So this is the summary of this last section. All right. 
Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm a bit over time, so thanks for staying with me. So today we looked at uh, yeah, basic debugging, right? Um, which is GDB, PDB. Um, if you have like Java, if you use Java .NET, then there are other programs, uh, JS as well. Yeah, but if you write C or C plus plus or Rust programs or any compiled language lah, uh, then you can use GDB. And yeah, uh, we look at some basic profiling um, using perf. Uh, yeah, and we use we look at flame graph to like uh, visualize uh, profiles. Um, we have uh, system monitoring. Um, tools will like see what's uh, basically look at the resource usage on your system overall and we look at some other tools to basically look at the sensors and like stress test your system so um, the focus today was just to introduce the different tools and what you can look at with them right um, because I I mean I believe that you know uh, these skills are come down to like uh, sort of intuition and experience not like when you see when something goes wrong then based on what is wrong you might uh, you will, you know, after a while, you get the, you will gain the, uh, sort of, uh, yeah, intuition, lah, right, on to what to look at and figure out, and, and then how to figure out what is exactly wrong, right. But the first step is to know what tools, um, to use, lah, uh, to be able to figure out, uh, you know, whatever is wrong, right. So, uh, that's the end for today. And, uh, yeah, thanks for joining us today. And, uh, if you have any feedback, uh, please uh, let us know and fill in the form here. So I will uh, send the link to the chat. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Yeah, thanks for joining us today.